If you're overweight or obese, you have a chronic disease of excess fat that increases your risk of loads of serious health problems. Being overweight doesn't occur because someone is lazy or slothful. It can happen to anyone and is much more nuanced than eating too much and not moving. In many ways, society literally feels like it conspires to make us fat. If we're lucky, we have hormones and genetics in our favor, but even if we're not, there is always something we can do to tip the balance in our favor of not only looking, but feeling healthy. This video is a two-parter. In the first part, I talk more about the causes and assessment of obesity. And in part two, all about the evidence-based ways to lose weight with and without medication. Stay tuned to learn more about why weight matters. Many diseases exist on a spectrum from health to disease to disease. For example, some people have differing abilities to manage sugar or glucose in their bodies after meals from normal, efficient use and partitioning of sugar to diseased, inefficient states like prediabetes and diabetes. Most people have sensitive normal lungs, but some have sensitivity to allergens or exercise or cold or just very sensitive lungs like we have in asthma. We can think of weight in a similar way. We oscillate on a spectrum from the right weight for us to being overweight to being obese, sometimes all in the same year. Obesity is the medical term for being overweight. It is a disease of excess body fat. Being obese is not just about how you look, but about the risks associated with your health. There is a very, very clear correlation between getting fatter and having an increased risk of health problems. Very few people are obese and carry no increased risk of other health problems. There are two ways in which we determine weight and its risk to your health. BMI is a score based on your height and weight. Just knowing your weight is helpful when monitoring your own weight, but not useful if you want to know how your weight is affecting your health. That's where the BMI comes in. You can use the BMI tool in the section below to calculate your score. Your score will tell you whether you have an ideal, nor ideal or normal weight, or if you're underweight, overweight, or obese. Morbid obesity is when you have a high BMI, over 40, and it means that your weight is a serious and imminent threat to health. The more overweight you are, the worse your health risk. The BMI is a useful measure to give a snapshot of how much excess body fat you have. It's not perfect because it's an indirect measure. It doesn't tell us exactly how much fat you have and where it is. And it's not great for very muscular people, but it's enough to rapidly quantify risk. And in the context of a clinic, we don't have time to accurately do this. So this is a useful proxy marker. We're quite good at monitoring and measuring this because the whole team gets involved and we collect it when you join the practice, but we're terrible at doing something about it. GPs are quite good at monitoring and measuring the BMI because the whole team gets involved and we collect it routinely, often when you join the practice and now and again when we see you. The problem is that we're terrible at doing something about it. It's pretty rare for your GP or your primary care team or for any healthcare professional for that matter to actively bring up a conversation about weight, even if you're morbidly obese. The other marker for obesity is waist circumference. This is a great marker for health risk, but we tend to use it much less as it's just a bit more of a faff to do and there is some variation in how people measure it. It's much easier to just jump on a scale and get your height and much more less chance to screw this up than measuring your girth. FYI, I do both in clinic because often people will have the same BMI, but their waist circumference will be different. The one with a bigger waist circumference will be the one with a higher risk of disease. Remember, obesity is a disease of excess fat. Where you store it is just as important as how much you store. If you store it on your butt and your thighs, it's not great, but it's less of a risk. Women tend to do this more. And if you store it around your midriff, then you have a much higher risk. This excess fat stored is in and around your organs. Very quick aside, when we store fat, most of it goes underneath our skin, subcutaneous fat, and this is fine. Everyone has this. If you store more and more fat, eventually, for most of us, our fat cells have no more space. Then we need to store this excess fat elsewhere. This elsewhere is in and around our vital organs. Needless to say, stuffing your organs with fat doesn't make them work better. It tends to be a downward, slow spiral from there. 
To measure your waist circumference, place a tape measure around your waist at belly button level, and if your waist is more than 80 centimeters as a woman and 94 centimeters as a man, your risk is increased. The higher it is, the bigger the risk. Obesity is one of the leading causes of death and disability worldwide. Let me say it again. Obesity is one of the leading causes of death and disability worldwide. Practically, I see a lot of people in clinic who have a host of symptoms that they think may be related to another problem, but actually they're all related to obesity. Feeling tired, difficulty sleeping and snoring, shortness of breath, joint pains, lack of self-esteem and confidence. That's what you come in with. And with continued weight gain, the risk of the following diseases massively increase. Unable to manage sugar, AKA type two diabetes, too much fat in the blood associated with increased risk of heart disease and stroke, high blood pressure, sleep problems like snoring, fertility problems like infertility, polycystic ovary syndrome, pregnancy complications, gout, heartburn, gallstones, fatty liver, asthma, cancer of the colon, cancer of the ovaries. It's a long list, maybe about 40 specific diseases and not rare diseases, all the common stuff that will make you ill very soon and that we see in clinic every day. It's no surprise that if you're overweight, your life expectancy decreases by about eight to 10 years if your BMI is over 40. I'm gonna say this again too, your lifespan can decrease by 10 years if your BMI is high. 10 years of life. Two out of every three people are overweight or obese. That means in a typical day of clinic where I see 30 adults, 20 have a disease of excess fat storage and none of them are coming to see me about that problem specifically. It also means that most people are overweight and have an increased risk of all of the above. It's no surprise that we talk of an obesity epidemic. Everyone kind of knows why we get overweight based on the calories in, calories out hypothesis. If the calories we eat are more than the calories we burn, then we put on weight by storing the excess as fat. If the calories we eat are less than the calories we burn, then we lose weight. If the calories we eat are the same roughly as the calories we burn, then our weight generally remains stable. This hypothesis generally holds true, but there are a few caveats. 100 calories of carrots is not the same as 100 calories of Krispy Kreme donuts. They have the same total energy, but our body acts very differently in how it deals with it and stores it. There are over 37 hormones that regulate our appetite and caloric intake. Loads of things affect how these hormones operate, especially our hunger and satiety hormones, as well as the hormones that regulate fat storage. If we have other diseases, or well, the more overweight we are, these hormones just stop working normally, and then they make it much easier to put on more weight. Ever notice how your appetite expands when you put on more weight? That's the hormones just working less efficiently. 50% of the food we consume is ultra processed. When you see these types of foods. Someone has created these so they last forever on a shelf and they tap into that part of your primitive brain that craves high fat and high sugar. And when you eat them, you just can't stop and you eat beyond your normal limits. Some foods act like drugs on our bodies and we just can't get enough of them. Beyond the food that we eat, and most of us are eating more than we used to a few decades ago and more than our bodies need, physical activity is also really important. When it comes to purely obesity, physical activity is secondary to what we eat. But when it comes to whole body benefits, there is nothing better than exercise. Like most things in life, a little bit goes a long way. And even an hour a week can have dramatic effects on weight and mood and reorienting your lifestyle better than any drug that exists anywhere. For more information on exercise, do check out my video on five habits to live forever. A misconception about obesity is that people usually have a medical or strongly genetic cause for being overweight. It's really rare that people have a disease that directly makes people put on weight. The commonest ones we see in clinic in this vein are hypothyroidism. This can definitely make it trickier to lose weight, but we think that this only accounts for a maximum of a few extra kilos. It's just not the whole story. 
When it comes to genes, there are a number of genes associated with being overweight that can affect the way we store food and our sense of fullness after eating, but they're a small part of the puzzle too. We don't routinely test for these genetic differences as they have a relatively small influence. The most important thing is that even these genetic factors are within our control. We can do things that will affect how our genes are expressed or how they work. This is called epigenetics, how what we do in our life switches on and off our genes. The more good things we do, eat right, or exercise, the more of those good genes get expressed, i.e. I feel full, and the more sensitive our body becomes to our own hormones, and it starts to downregulate the ones that make us sicker. Some medicines too can make us put on extra pounds. I usually see this in the context of people using long-term steroids, insulin or epileptic medications. These are the main things relevant to obesity, but other factors such as the chronic stress, menopause, sleep deprivation and income can also play a role. Assuming you are happy to talk about your weight, I would be really interested to learn more about how long weight has been an issue for you. I'm interested in your diet, your activity and your stress levels. How has it affected you? How do you feel about your weight? Do you have any of the symptoms I mentioned above that could could indicate a disease associated with obesity, like thyroid disease? Is there a family history of weight issues or medical issues that could be secondary to this? Are you taking any medications? And tell me more about your willingness to lose weight and the past experiences of trying to lose weight. How, what worked, what didn't and why. After doing a BMI, a waist circumference and blood pressure, I would definitely arrange a blood test. Blood tests are really helpful to know if your obesity is causing these secondary diseases. And at the very least, I would normally do a test for things like diabetes, cholesterol, thyroid, uric acid and liver function tests. I found it an extremely powerful tool to repeat these blood tests, the BMI and the blood pressure after about three months of weight loss. Seeing profound effects and benefits in your health in such a short space of time is very motivating, often more so than the weight loss itself. Obesity in the UK is endemic with two out of three people overweight or obese. It seems like a simple problem to fix, eat less, do more, but it just doesn't work that way and it's just not that simple. Obesity can be very complex with community, society, the food industry and technology often conspiring against us. Obesity is a disease. It needs to be viewed as such and addressed as such. Life expectancy can be decreased by as much as 10 years. Obesity massively increases the risk of other serious diseases too. In part two, let's talk about the best evidence-based ways to lose weight with and without medication. Thanks for watching this one. Till next time, stay healthy.